Min everybody. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Sometimes I think I say good morning before it's actually started. I don't know what's going on here. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Arise with Sally Goodwin. It is so good to see you all this morning on this beautiful Friday. Thank the Lord, it's Friday, and it is, let me see, Friday the 27th of January. Friday the 27th of January, 2023. And it is another beautiful day in Africa, another gorgeous day requiring fans <laughs> and things to cool me down while I bring this message, but it is a lovely day here in Cape Town. And I'm trusting that it is a lovely day wherever you are and wherever you are joining this live from and wherever you are situated at this point in time because we have visitors uh, on these lives. Good morning, Simone. Lovely to see you this morning. Uh, we have visitors on these lives from all over the place. Remind me, Simone, you're from Grayton, I think. As far as I know, if I remember correctly, forgive me if I don't remember correctly, but I seem to think that you're from Grayton. And uh, we have, yeah, we have viewers and people who come and follow and join um, from all over the world, which is such a privilege and an honor and a blessing. And so wherever you are and whatever the weather is like in the nation or the city or the place that you are joining from, Yes, Grayton. My husband and I love Grayton. Good morning, Rene. Lovely to see you. Good morning. Wow. Manchester's in the house. Good morning, Mebeka. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Good morning. 5 a.m. in Manchester. Wow. It's such a privilege to have you on. Thank you for joining this morning. Good morning, Martha. So good to see you all, man. I'm just so excited to have you all on this morning. And when I get guests from other nations and other places who I've never seen on the live before, I get even more excited because it's just like, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, it feels like the whole world is just uniting to just um, hear what God has to say, to hear the word of the Lord. Um, and it's a very respectable seven o'clock in the morning in Cape Town. But um, I honestly, I honor the fact that you are joining um, at five o'clock in the morning, Rebecca. Really, really, I do. Good morning, Renilwe. Lovely to have you on. So good you could make it this morning. I know I've already had a message from Bertha and um, somebody else messaged me to say that they have load shedding. Load shedding. I'm very careful about how I say that now because people keep hearing the wrong thing. So load shedding um, that we are going through as a nation at the moment. So they have no electricity right now. So they cannot join the live because of that. No electricity equals no Wi-Fi and data is very expensive. So then they don't actually, they aren't able to join the, the live. But thank the Lord, they can catch up later on and watch later on but it's just i think that um you miss when you don't join the live i think what people miss sorry i'm just trying to get myself oh, situated here um i think what people miss when they don't join the live is the interaction with everybody else and um, just being able to you know interact with everyone during the live um, i know that that's always um, a lot of fun because we're building this community, which is amazing. And there are some interesting things in the works. Um, as I've told you all, there's, I'm busy um, speaking to amazing women about uh, publishing and uh, producing and publishing my devotional book, um, devotional slash journal, which is based on the women in the Bible. And there will be many, many, many volumes because uh, we've only gotten to the end of two kings and um, that's the first two books already because I'm doing 40 day devotionals because I think that's easier to cope with so that's very exciting um, and then yes I'm looking at a few other things I have an NPC that I've registered uh, that is called um, Activate Her and I'm looking at getting that up and running a little bit more and um, and possibly doing kind of a Zoom connection meetings with ladies, um, you know, once, once every two weeks or something and just providing a flat, 
platform where women can get together online because you think you can join from anywhere in the world and we can just chat and women can share and we can pray for each other and support each other and build a community an online community um, so and I know it's amazing to meet in person it really really is and there might there will always be some in person meetings but um, but I think you know we all recognize the fact that it's not possible to meet in person uh, for many of us because we live for example um, in Manchester uh, and um, but to be able to be part of a community like a zoom community where where women can just support each other you know I think that that is so important and so I'm um, so I'm looking at that these are all things that are coming they they in the they kind of in the pipeline um, I am having my website redone and rebranded uh, because it just feels like God is saying it's a new season so um, please um, stand with me because as always these things cost and um, and I'm trusting God for finance to you know that it's his vision so it's his bowl and he will provide the finances for these things I'm really trusting for finance and um, so yeah so I just I would like to bring women together in the easiest most convenient possible way um, you know probably in the evening when you know you can have if for, especially because women lots of women work you can have put your kids to bed and you know or left your husband to sort them out or whatever the case may be um, and um, and then um, and if you're a single mom, you can have a babysitter or something, and then we can get together and just, I don't know, I have no idea exactly what it's going to look like. It's, these are just things that are kind of, that I feel like God is laying on my heart uh, for what once, you know, the website's up and running and a few things have been put in place. So I'm just letting you ladies in on, an, uh, in early, <laughs> in on it early. And then um, again, just to remind you that on the 26th of February at Anna Beulah Farm in Durbanville, which is in Cape Town, uh, my international friends, unfortunately, unless you want to fly in quickly to attend, um, we will be meeting. Good morning, Jane. Lovely to see you. We will be meeting um, one o'clock on Sunday, the 26th of February. There's going to be a ladies meeting organized by my beautiful friend, Jessie. And, uh, and yeah, we will be hearing from God and there'll be some prophetic ministry and a message and we'll just see where God, where God takes that. So that's on the 26th of Feb. The invitation is on my Facebook, it's on my Instagram, um, it's on my WhatsApp profile. And please, if you want to attend that meeting, please RSVP to Jesse. Jesse's all, I'm just showing up. <laughs> um, Jesse is doing everything. So please RSVP to JC and organize payment with her. It's only 140 Rand um, and it, it covers coffee and a light lunch. So please um, feel free to get in touch with JC directly and organize all of that. Okay, so let us move on to what I have felt God lay on my heart this morning. So on Wednesday, we spoke about the fact that we are now in the Hebrew month of Shabbat. So any of you who missed Wednesday's um, live, please feel free to go back and have a look at that. Um, the Hebrew month of Shabbat, we spoke about that on Wednesday morning. And we spoke about the fact that um, the, the constellation in the sky over this Hebrew month is Aquarius. Again, no astrology necessary, just the fact that God created the constellation and put it in the sky. And so it is Aquarius, and that's obviously water, represents water. And we spoke about how we need to be sure that we are, we are meditating on and receiving from the living water, that the water we are getting in is the water of life. And so that the roots buried deep inside us and other people will be awakened to the water of life. And, we, and also the, the thing is, the... Um, one concept to just maybe meditate on as well while you are considering you know what you allow into your eyes and your ears and your heart and you know is where you are getting your water from you know we all are called to give out living water but we are all also need to receive and so where are you getting your living water from and are you getting your living water from sources that would be you know godly and jesus focused and jesus orientated 
Um, are you the other things that you're meditating on and the things, you know, the, the places and the spaces that you are receiving your living water are those places and spaces where God is present and where you know he's there and you ex get to experience the Holy Spirit and you get to experience Jesus. And that can be online, it can be in person, it can be anything. And it can be, you know, um, being here with me, which is a privilege, <laughs> if that is, this is where you get your living water, then I could consider that to be an absolute privilege. Okay, so just to interrupt and say that our wonderful waste technicians are connect collecting our waste. So if you can hear a dustbin truck and shouting outside, then that is what it is. Um, what would we do without them? We would be overrun. Okay, so in light of all of that, in the, so um, let me just tie this all together before I even get into it. So in light of all of that, and in light of the fact that we've looked at Ezra and Nehemiah, and a couple of lives ago we looked at um, Jeremiah, and we've been looking at some verses that as Christians we like to quote, and we like to stand on them, but we don't, we often um, could be, accused of or could be guilty of taking them out of context and so sometimes we stand on scriptures that actually we haven't we don't understand the full context of the scripture we haven't read the the backstory and the you know the prologue and the epilogue or the prequel and the sequel and um, and so we we and that actually knowing the basis of where that scripture came from actually builds our faith in standing on it but it also is that very water of life that awakens our roots because if you just take one little scripture and you hold on to that one little scripture with no understanding or basis for where it came from or what God was actually saying then sometimes you miss out on the full picture of what God is trying to show you so sometimes God drops a verse into your spirit and he's like like what two lives ago we spoke about Jeremiah 29 11 you know God drops this verse Jeremiah 29 11 into your spirit and you go and you read the verse and you're like wow that's amazing and this is a promise of God over your life but God's requirement of you is actually to not only read that particular verse but to read the, the the story the context what what is around that verse because then you get a full picture of what he's actually trying to say to you so we have many verses that I like to call that we use as um, I like to call as like Christian cliches. You know, we trot them out and we prophesy over people and we quote them left, right and center and we litter our sermons and our messages with them. But often it's just the one verse and we, don't, we never get into explaining to people or teaching people where it came from, what the context is. You know, what, what you could have expected to be happening before that. What are you walking through now for that verse? If God gives you a verse to stand on, what are you walking through now? that God is calling you to stand on that verse because God doesn't call us to stand on things if he doesn't know that we're going to need them for something that we're going to walk through. So often looking at the context of the verse then explains to us why we're walking through what we're walking through and what God is trying to say. If God consistently gives you Joshua, uh, what is it, Joshua 1 verse 9, be strong and courageous, be very strong and very courageous. If he gives you that verse over and over, then you can bet your bottom dollar that you're going to walk through something that is going to require you to have both strength and courage. It is not, and it could be that you are crossing over into your promised land, but there are giants that you're going to face. And God is saying to you, I need you to be strong and courageous not just because it's lovely to be strong and courageous but because you are going to walk through something which is going to which where you will need to be strong and courageous so excuse me one second um, allergies so so that is what um, sort of where I want to go with just looking at some of the verses that are so close to our hearts as Christians that who many of us have heard We've heard them preached, we've heard them quoted, we've quoted them ourselves, but we actually haven't, uh, we don't fully understand necessarily. And a lot of those verses are found in the book of Joel. The book of Joel is an amazing book. It honestly is. It's so incredible. And it is such a pertinent book to read. And, and if you read the whole entire book of Joel, and I'm sure that a lot of you have, you will also find that a lot of the um, verses that we quote and a lot of the scriptures that we sort of that that we recognize in Christian songs and things like that are from the book of Joel and they're amazing but we need to understand the context so 
that's what I want to do this morning. And I'm not sure if we'll get through the whole lot. If we don't, we'll continue next week. But I'm going to do my best. I have what? I have half an hour. Uh, I have half an hour? Yeah, I have half an hour. So let's see what we can do. So the book of Joel, obviously, and again, as I always remind you, remind all of you obviously the book of Joel is it is the prophet Joel and he is prophesying over Israel and and all of the Old Testament prophets they are prophesying over Israel at the time and a lot of their prophecies came to pass within the history of Israel however there is a lot of prophetic significance within the Old Testament prophets that we can apply to where we are today because we are now as believers as laid down lovers of Jesus as ones who are fully surrendered to our Lord God we are grafted into the vine we have been grafted in we have been adopted we are co-heirs we are co-laborers we you know all of those things alongside Israel we don't as the Christian church we do not replace Israel Israel is the apple of God's eye they were God's firstborn his first I mean not his firstborn but you know what I mean his first choice Jesus was his firstborn his first choice they you know they are people who will always be close to God's heart but God then opened up the promise to the Gentiles because the Israelites didn't take what was on offer and um, and because God's heart was always for all of humanity but the church doesn't replace it doesn't replace Israel in the promises of God. The promises of God for Israel will always stand until eternity. But we have the privilege and the honor as Gentiles to be added in, to be grafted in, to be brought into those promises and for those promises to apply to us as much as they apply to Israel. So that is just an amazing privilege and an honor that we have as Gentiles. So the book of Joel, Joel is prophesying over um over over Israel at the time the name Joel means Jehovah is God Jehovah is God or Yahweh is God so that's what the name Joel means Yahweh is God or Jehovah is God an incredible name an incredible meaning and he's speaking he's prophesying over Israel however if any if you've ever heard any teachings on the book of Joel then you also know that some of the prophecies that Joel spoke of are considered to be eschatological prophecies in other words they weren't prophecies necessarily over Israel for that time that Joel Joel and Israel lived in, but they were actually eschatological prophecies that extended to the end times, to when Jesus comes back, to all of those things. And there is debate, scholarly debate, and academic debate over some of these things, but there is, Joel has a he has two layers to his book there and there is the one layer of that where he's prophesying over israel and some of those prophecies came to pass and then there is another layer where he's prophesying an eschatological prophecy in much the same manner that isaiah did about events that are still to come or events that are busy outworking in our world today and have been outworking ever since jesus was resurrected and we stepped into the end times oh, Sorry about that. <laughs> my sunscreen, my little, um, my little thing blew down. That happens every now and again. Apologies, and if not, something over which broke. My goodness, sometimes the things we go through. But I don't have anything else to keep the sun off my face. And if I have the sun on my face at 53 and menopausal, I will literally be sweating the whole entire time that I'm talking to you. Okay, so let us good look at the book of Joel. So we, the Joel chapter 1 is all about prophesying, you know, locusts coming over Israel and eating all their fruit and all of this, and the land being laid waste and the fact that they will um, mourn for the Lord, you know, mourn, yeah, mourn for the Lord, and that is a consequence of what has happened um, and the fact that Israel has stepped away from, from God. And that's, so that's Joel chapter 1. You're welcome to go and read that. I'm not really going to go into too much of that. But what I want to start, I want to start from Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2 in the um, New King James, what am I reading here? The New King James Version. Um, Joel chapter 2 is, is titled in the New King, King James Version because different translations have different titles for different sections. 
Joel chapter 2 is titled the day of the Lord. Now this is very, very significant, the day of the Lord. And why is this significant? Because the day of the Lord, if you look at uh, Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 7, it says, be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice, he has invited his guests. And the phrase, the day of the Lord, is one of the primary expressions in the Old Testament that is relevant to eschatological events. It properly refers to any time the Lord openly intervenes in the affairs of men. So there are two things to note here. The first is that when we speak, when the Old Testament, when the Bible speaks about the day of the Lord, in our own human understanding, what happens is we often assume it's a day, you know, sunrise to sunset, or a Jewish day, sunset to sunset. You know, we, we assume, we are, I think when we read the scriptures and we read something like the day of the Lord, we assume that it it is a day and that for example um, in Revelation when John says you know on the he was caught up you know on the day of the Lord and we think well is was that a Sunday you know was that a, <laughs> another day you know but actually the day of the Lord when it when it's when they speak of the day of the Lord in Scripture if you go and you look at like an, a concordance like Strong's concordance for example and you look at the the meaning behind the Hebrew for that the day of the Lord it does it can mean a day in our understanding of a day, morning to night, or a Jewish understanding of a day, sunset to sunset, it can mean that, and sometimes when prophets or people speak of the day of the Lord, that's what they meant, but more often than not, it actually means a period of time, it can mean a day, it can mean time, it can mean a year, um, it can designate such, I'm reading from Strong's, it can des designate such wide-ranging elements as the daylight hours from sunrise to sunset, a literal 24-hour cycle, a generic span of time, a given point in time. In the plural, the word may also mean the span of life or a year. The prophets often infuse the word with end times meanings or connotations, using it in connection with a future period of consequential events. So when we read the day of the Lord, what we need to, when we're reading in the Bible and we're understanding, you know, the context of what we are learning in the scripture, and we read something like the day of the Lord, we cannot, we mustn't immediately assume that it is a day a one day in history or in the future where something is going to take place. It doesn't necessarily mean that. What it can mean is a time period. It can even mean a year because it is God's day. And yes, God created time as we know it. However, it says in the scriptures that a thousand years is like a day to the Lord, you know? And um, so it doesn't necessarily mean a day. And I think sometimes our English translation, we lose the we lose the the fullness of the connotation of the Hebrew you know the Hebrew the Hebrew language is very complicated and words have so many different meanings and connotations and they're drawn from different root words and but and so we lose sometimes our English translation is very flat and we actually lose the fullness of what God is trying to tell us and that's why it's so good to consult concordances and things like that so when when Joel chapter 2 speaks of the day of the Lord he's not it's not referring to necessarily a day you know it's refer it could be referring to a, a a season you know an epoch a a year whatever it is so we really need discernment and we need God's wisdom and revelation when we read these things and so it starts off at the day of the Lord so it's like Joel is now describing the day of the Lord and it says blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming and then it says for it is at hand and it goes on to to describe the day of the Lord and Joel is prophesying over the Israelites over a physical enemy that is going to come against the Israelites and going to completely you know basically annihilate destroy Judah and Jerusalem take the Israelites into exile and we know that these are all things that actually happened but we also know if we read Revelation and we read eschatological um, 
scriptures, we also know that there is a day of the Lord coming, where which will be very similar, you know, where there is darkness and there will be um, clouds and thick darkness and, you know, and all of this kind of thing. So we know that he's prophesying a specific period, a, a specific thing over Israel that already occurred, but at the same time there is a prophetic significance for what is still to come for the world. So this, they talk about the day of the Lord, the day, and at the end of Joel 2, it says, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? And now, so now here is this day of the Lord that is prophesied. Okay, now we move on to the next part of Joel chapter 2. And now you're going to start recognizing scriptures that are often quoted or spoken of. And this is titled in the New King James Version, this, um, this from verse 12 in Joel chapter 2, it is entitled a call to repentance. So God has now said there is a day coming, this great and terrible day of the Lord is coming. But now I am calling you to repentance. And it says, now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart. And then if you go down to verse 15, and we've all heard this, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, let the priests, verse 17, let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. And we've heard that. And so what, what I'm saying here is if we look at this as prophetically significant for where we are as a nation, South Africa, for where we are globally, there is a day of the Lord that is coming, the great and terrible day of the Lord that we all know is coming. When it's coming, we're not sure how it's coming. There are many people who disagree on exactly what that looks like. That is neither here nor there. We know that there is a day of the Lord that is coming. And what happens prior to that? There is a call to repentance. There is is a call to blow the trumpets, to consecrate a fast, to gather the people. And if you look at the chaos and what is happening in nations all around the world, not just our own nation, you know, we don't get to stand as just South Africa anymore going, oh my word, we have all these issues. Nations all around the world, there is chaos. There is, there is, there are things going on that just the whole world seems to be in this, in a state of uproar, in a state of decay, in a state of literally falling apart. So what better time is there for this call to repentance to go out, for this, this, this call to blow the trumpet and consecrate fast, and then let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. And they're speaking here of the Holy of Holies, you know, between the porch and the altar, the porch, which was the outer side of the holy of the temple where the people could gather and the, and the altar, which was inside the Holy of Holies, where, where only the priests could go, where the presence of the Lord was. And we are priests of the Lord. We are called to weep between the porch and the altar, to weep in intercession, to weep in, in repentance, to weep for the peoples of the earth, the peoples of the earth who desperately need to be called to repentance, to experience God, to get to know Jesus before this great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And the fact that we don't know when the day of the Lord will be is completely irrelevant because Jesus has never said to us, okay, at this point in time, on the whatever of January 2023, you can stop doing these things. We never get to stop doing these things. We get to intercede, to cry out to God, to pray for our nations, to pray for our people, to be priests of the Lord who weep between the porch and the altar. We get to be those people until, as Renilwe says, until the fullness of time has come and that great and terrible day of the Lord comes. We don't get to stop doing that at any point in time. These are things we get to do and we sing these things and we say these things and we decree and declare these fasts but I don't know that unless we read the whole book of Joel and understand why God was calling the Israelites to repentance because what was he saying would happen that we get the context and we use these verses and we quote these scriptures so lightly and I think without any connotation or any understanding or any comprehension of the gravity and the severity of what God is calling the people to, of what God calls us to. And then it goes on. So there's this call to repentance, this call to be these, these priests who weep between the porch and the altar, this call to be a people who blow the trumpet, sound the alarm, consecrate a fast, and do all of those things. Then it moves in to the land refreshed. And so Joel chapter 2, verse 18, then says, Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. 
But why? Not because for no reason, but because of what they have already gone through and what they have done in terms of being called to repentance. And then we come to another verse that we have heard quoted many, many, many times. For he has given, and this is Joel chapter 2 verse 23, For he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. How many times have you heard prophecies and messages about the, the former rain and the latter rain, and how the former rain has already fallen, and how we trust for the latter rain to fall. But do we need to understand and read the scripture that comes before that, and look and see what has to take place before that latter rain comes before that latter rain comes there is a, a time in in history a day of the lord when this all comes together and you know just a, um another because when when we spoke about that day of the lord and um, the the explanation that is given in zephaniah where it says it properly refers to any time the lord openly intervenes in the affairs of man if you have been following me for any length of time you will have heard me speak about convergence you will have heard me speak about the fact that god has told me that this decade this decade that we are in right now from 2020 to 2030 whatever whenever you think a new decade starts or 2021 to 2030 this 10 year period between 2020 and 2030 where God has told me that this is one of the most significant decades since Jesus walked the earth and he has told me that this will be a time of convergence and I preached a message on this oh golly in 2021 if you've been following me for any length of time it's somewhere in the annals of my teachings there is a message on convergence where God said to me that there will be a convergence of his kairos time so when the prophets speak of the day of the Lord they are referring to any time the Lord openly intervenes in the affairs of man and God's kairos time is when God moves sovereignly when he says I am moving whether you move or not whether you you either in or you out you either with me or not but I am choosing to move because I am God and I get to choose to move and how God spoke to me about the fact that we are in this decade of convergence where God's kairos time and our chronos time converge into one where he chooses to move sovereignly across the earth and I'm going to give you a testimony now now of how he is moving sovereignly he's not waiting for any church he's not waiting for any leadership he's not waiting for any man or woman to stand up and say this is the time it's now he is moving I've spoken often before again if you've been following me for any length of time I have spoken about how the next move of God the third great awakening the next um reformation whatever we are waiting for how it is not going to be i don't even think and this could be very controversial for many of you it's as far as i know from what god has shown me it is going to happen outside of the church and i'm going to share a testimony with you now now that bears that up it is going to happen outside of the church and it is not going to be led there isn't no church is going to be able to stick its name to it no man or woman are going to be able to say well, i was the one that heralded in this next re re reformation this third great awakening it is going to be a grassroots move of the spirit where the holy spirit is going to convict people and people are going to rise up people who nobody knows you know who, who aren't famous names or celebrity christians they are just grassroots laid down fully surrendered lovers of jesus who are going to be called to step into things and reformation is going to come awakening is going to come god is going to do it sovereignly he is going to move people he is going to bring his kairos time into our chronos time and there is going to be a convergence in this decade and that is why i keep saying to people what is your vision for this decade not just for 2023 what is your vision for the rest of this decade have you sat with god have you dreamed with him what does it look like for you the rest of this decade have you have you dreamed big bigger 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 have you have you got things that you have written down as your vision for this decade that you don't even know how they're going to be accomplished i'm telling you i'm prophesying over you now in the name of jesus christ of Nazareth. 
Nazareth, that they will be accomplished by God and God alone, that he will move sovereignly and he will put people across your path and he will put you in the right place at the right time and no man or woman will be able to take credit for God's move in your life because God is going to get the glory and only God is going to get the glory. Those are the times we are in right now, people. Those are the times we are in right now. So when we read Joel, that is those, these are the things that need to be in our minds and in our hearts as we read these scriptures. And so we go on. So the, the verse that, that I often quote and the verse that, um, that lots of people quote regularly is this one. So we've dealt with the former and the latter rain. God is going to get the glory for the latter rain, people. Nobody else. Nobody else is going to get the glory for the latter rain. I'm sorry. My nose is driving me insane. So then we get to Joel chapter 2, verse 25. And this is what a verse that we quote so frequently. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. And so often we quote this verse and we're like, God says he's going to restore the years that the locust has eaten. And we quote that verse with no understanding of what went before that verse and the fact that at the end of that verse, God very controversially says, my great army, which I sent among you. Understand something, this verse in Joel, what Joel is speaking of here, God sent the locusts. God sent the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust. God sent the great army that annihilated Israel at the time. God, those were things, God put those things in place. That wasn't Satan, it wasn't a plan of the enemy, that wasn't anything. God put those things in place to bring Israel to their knees so that there would be a call for repentance that would be heard in the hearts of the people, that they would call, that they would be weeping between the porch and the altar, that God could then do his thing with restoring the land. So when we say God has promised that he will restore the years the locust has eaten, be very careful because if God gives you that promise, then you need to look back and be like, okay, what has the locust eaten exactly? Or is there still stuff? Is God going to send something that, that will, and this is very controversial because we love to apportion, we love to give the enemy credit for these things. And yes, there is an enemy. And yes, he seeks to, to, kill, to steal, kill, and destroy. And yes, he's like a lion trying to devour us. Absolutely. But what we don't like to recognize in this day and age of church is that the, the hand of God is in some things. Because how do you bring a nation to its knees? How do you bring a globe, a, a, a world, how do you bring humanity to its knees? How do you bring people to a place when they call out to God. People don't call out to God when they are all happy and comfortable and joyful and everything is going well. Even laid down lovers of Jesus, when you are in a good space and everything's amazing, how often does your does your relationship with God, does your intimacy with God take a bit of a back seat or slide a little bit because everything's good? And then as soon as something goes wrong, we step into that calling out again to him because now we need God. How do you bring a nation to its knees except by sending? the devouring locust and the great army so we can quote that verse absolutely and if god has given you that verse as a promise that he will restore the years the locust has eaten you stand on that promise but you need to understand the context of where that promise comes from and you need to understand that if god is saying to you that he will restore the years the locust has eaten the balance of that verse says that he is the one who sent the locust so then we need to sit with god a little bit and interrogate him slightly and be like, Jesus, if you sent the locust, what was it that you were trying to achieve? What, what, was your, what was your end goal? What was the bigger picture? Where do we get the victory? Because if you sent the locust, but you were promising to restore those years, then you also know that there is a victory to be had in this moment. And how do we get to partake of that victory? We don't get to just sit back and be like, oh, wow, God is going to restore the years the locust has eaten. It doesn't work like that. We get to co-create. We get to co-labor. We get to do these things alongside. We get to partner with God, which means we get to walk through some of the stuff God speaks so that he can bring his will to bear, his time, his kairos time, into our chronos time. And these verses like this that we kind of, we just sort of, you know, willy-nilly speak out without any context or without any knowledge, 
pardon me, or understanding for what they actually mean in their fullness. You know, we, our words are so powerful, people. And so we preach these verses or we speak these verses or we quote these verses and we have no idea what we're saying, but we're putting it out there into the spiritual um, realm. And God is like, okay, awesome. Well, here we go then. And then we're like, oh my word, I don't understand why this is happening. And I don't understand. And God's like, well, look, go read the verse. Go read the scripture again. What was I saying to you? So we need to read these things in context. We need to read the whole verse. How many of you have heard that verse, I'll restore the years the locust has eaten, and have never heard the last bit of it, which says, my great army which I sent among you? How many of you have been told that God will restore the years the locust has eaten, and nobody has ever even intimated to you that God might have sent the thing that sent the locust, sent the army, sent the thing that, had, that, that stole some of those years that he can now restore. So just, it's so important. It is so very, very important to actually understand what we are talking about when we talk about these things. So I, okay, so I, I, I think I'm gonna stop there because I have five minutes left and I wanna share this testimony with you. And I have, this is not my testimony, this is a testimony that a beautiful friend of mine told me, and I'm, 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 I have permission to share it, I'm not mentioning any names, I just want to share this testimony. You know, ladies and gentlemen, you know how I have been crying out to the Lord for hope, hope for our nation, hope for our continent, hope for our, hope for our land, you know, and then God highlights these things to me, like the, the day of the Lord, call to repentance, you know, all of these things, and I'm like, Jesus. Yes, absolutely. I hear, I understand, I acknowledge, I repent, I do all of those things, but we still, we need hope. And then I sit with this incredibly anointed, powerful, amazing friend of mine yesterday, and she shares this testimony with me. And so this, it's in, this testimony is in South Africa, um, a country, and, um, and a terrible tragedy happens. And a man who, who was a husband um, and a son, um, I don't know if he was a father, I'm not sure if they had children, but this man who was a husband, he had a wife and he was a son, he had a, a mom still living, um, he has a seizure in his swimming pool and drowns. So t tragedy, hey? he has a seizure in his swimming pool and he drowns. So obviously he's now passed on and he, the, the funeral happens. And the funeral, for as far as I could understand, takes place within their home. So their home, their home is opened up and these people come to this funeral. But this man was a man who was a man of influence, um, economically, um, I'm assuming politically, but he was a man of influence. So he had, so he knew people of influence, um, people who influence our nation economically, people who influence our nation politically. He was a man of influence who, was, who knew people of influence. And so all of these people of influence came to his funeral. And so he, the home was filled with with all of these people who are influencers within our nation South Africa and they came to the funeral of this man who had passed on in such tragic circumstances and so this man has a mom and his mom has not spoken one word since this man passes she hasn't spoken one word since this man passes she is bereft she is bereaved she is grieved and she is obviously processing and dealing with the tragedy of losing her son the funeral happens and it gets to the end of the funeral and I'm, I'm using a little bit of license um, with some of the facts because I think that I heard these things um, but I might, I might not have got the story completely straight but that's not, uh, the basic facts are right but um, I, I'm thinking that it got to the end of the funeral, I think that's what was said. And the mother stands up, now bearing in mind that the mother has not spoken since the son passed, okay? And the mother stands up and she says, can she speak? And she is given permission to speak. And she stands there and she says to people, she tells people, she takes them on a little journey through her son's life. And she tells them that she is a God-fearing, oh, sorry, she is a God-fearing woman and a lover of Jesus. 
and how her son had walked a road where he had walked um, away from from Jesus. Um, I'm assuming that at some point he probably did know Jesus because his mom was a believer, but he had walked and he had walked into Buddhism and he had walked into Hinduism and he had walked into a few other things and a few other, um, tried out a few other religions. But towards the end, of um towards the end of his life which they didn't know would be the end of his life him and his mom had had some really good conversations and he had recommitted his life to jesus he had given his life back to god he had put himself on the right road again and he had this god-fearing believing mom who probably never stopped praying for a single second for this wayward son and this wayward son came back to god and this mom had the peace of knowing that he had come back to God. So she shares the story at this funeral, but she doesn't stop there. She then begins to preach this grieving mother. Oh, I'm sorry. It makes me so emotional. And even just, just listening to it yesterday with my friend, I was just so emotional. Um, this grieving mother, this grieving woman of God, begins to preach the word of the Lord at this funeral filled with these people of influence. And so the person um, that my friend knows who was at the funeral um, and was sitting, I presume, somewhere near the front, um, she had been praying, also a believer, a lover of Jesus, she had been praying the whole way through the funeral, obviously for the family and all of this kind of thing. And now this woman starts to preach the, the good news. She starts to preach the message of Jesus. She starts to tell people that the only way to God is through Jesus. And she starts to, tell, to, 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 to testify all of this in front of them. And then she reaches the end of her of her testimony of her preach and she does an altar call she says if there is anybody here who would like to give their lives to jesus who wants to know that they will spend eternity with the father who wants to to get to know this god that has welcomed my son into eternity if there's anybody here i would like you to stand and i would like you to repeat the prayer after me this woman the funeral of her son this grieving mother takes the time to share this journey her son went through and to call people, to invite people to enter into a relationship with Jesus. The, the, the lady who was at the funeral um, was sitting near the front and she didn't want to turn around and see who was standing. But she said that the volume of the voices of people who stood and, and confessed Jesus as Lord and received Jesus as their Savior and stood and, and, and asked God into their hearts, the people who did that, the volume of the voices, it made her realize and recognize that there were many, many, many of these people who were so overcome with emotion, so overcome with the kindness of the Holy Spirit, so overcome by the words preached by this grieving mother that they were standing in that space and they were giving their lives to Jesus. They were giving their lives to Jesus. These people of influence, these people of economic influence and political influence in our nation were brought to repentance by the kindness of the Holy Spirit at the funeral of one of their own by a mother who had the strength, even in her own grief, to stand and speak the word of God. And you know, I do not know the name of that mother. I don't even know the name of the, of the gentleman who passed on. But her name has gone down in eternity her name will be in history in the history of eternity as the grieving mother who was not afraid to stand up and share the gospel with people who desperately needed to hear it and she we may never know her name probably we will never know her name and we may never know the people who stood in that space and gave their lives to jesus but god is moving in that at that funeral god's kairos time and our chronos time converged and god moved sovereignly in that room and i can hear the doubts in some of your minds that you are thinking oh but people were probably overcome by the emotion of the moment and you know maybe the next day they went straight back to their old lives and that is an enormous possibility however Seeds were planted, words were spoken, people confessed Jesus as Lord with their mouths and received him into themselves and God does not let that go. 
God doesn't just let that go. You, a seed has been sowed, a words have been spoken, a confession has been made, and the Holy Spirit will hotly pursue those people until he brings them fully and completely into the kingdom of God. This, is hap this happened in our nation, ladies and gentlemen, in our nation where we feel so hopeless and so helpless and so overcome by the giants of racism and the giants of corruption and the strongholds of fear and the orphan spirit. All of those things in our nation, South Africa, God is moving and if we are not paying attention, we are going to miss it. We are going to miss the move of God because we are not paying attention because we are so caught up in the bad news that is being broadcast over loudspeakers and in newspapers and online. And we do not live in denial. We understand what's going on in our nation so we can pray into it. But at the same time, we need to say to God, God, let us hear the testimonies of hope. Give us those testimonies. Let us hear the testimonies of hope that show us that you are moving. That nobody can take credit for that space. No church can take credit. A, a lot of those people who were there are potentially people who would never set foot in a church. But God moved. There was a little mini revival at that funeral, in that space, at that place. And these are people who wield influence over our nation. So we don't know who they are. And we don't know were their names or anything like that, but I'm encouraging you, if you intercede for South Africa, you intercede for those people. You intercede that those seeds bear fruit. You intercede that God gets to use those people mightily to bring our nation into God's destiny and into the vision that God has for us. You intercede that those are people who will impact Africa, not just South Africa, but the African content, continent. You intercede that those people will imp have a global impact because they have heard the the word of God and being convicted by the kindness of the Holy Spirit. Let us be the priests who weep between the porch and the altar for those people who gave their lives to Jesus at that funeral. Let us be the ones who intercede between the porch and the altar for that grieving mother who had the strength of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit inside of her, to stand up at her son's funeral and speak the word of God and see people convicted and brought to repentance. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what we are called to. The day of the Lord is coming. We, are, we, we live amongst days of the Lord that happen around us and we don't even know that they're happening. But let us not be people who take little scraps of scripture and use those as kind of little weapons when we don't understand the fullness or the context or exactly what God is saying because we haven't had taken the time to actually pay attention to what is in the scripture, the fullness of the story that God is speaking in the scripture. Let us not be those people. Okay, I trust that that testimony gave you such incredible hope because it's given me such incredible hope. I'm just like, you move, Lord. You move outside of the church, inside of the church, wherever you choose to move, you move. You move. You. We give you freedom. We give you permission to, to do your Kairos thing across our nation, across our continent, across the globe, because we want to see. We want to see the day of the Lord come where we can stand triumphant by his side. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I now have gone over time yet again. And uh, we will continue this next week, Wednesday at 7 a.m. We're going to continue to go through the rest of Joel. And we are going to have a look at some more of those verses that we hear quoted and spoken of and sung of and we don't understand them. So bless you. Have an absolutely incredibly blessed and highly favored weekend. And I will see you next week. Love you. Bless you.